technology platform, logical technology. So this is where this is kind of showing you a representation of how we would store this type of information in the architecture context framework. Um, here's the uh, this is the uh, architecture vision and requirements um, section. You know the gaps. So, so a lot of these documents, when we're generating them, we, we need to start putting them into this repository. The benefits of the architecture framework: it, it provides a comprehensive checklist of the outputs, helps us get a better vision of what we're trying to integrate, and uh, the the thought process that goes back to you. It helps with consistency, right? We're trying to get all these documents, and we're trying to be consistent across all these products. Deliverables, artifacts, and building blocks. Um, you know, here's a list of what them. Here's some, what some of them are. Um, the building blocks. I mean, that one. That one's pretty big. We'll talk more about that in the enterprise continuum, and the artifacts. I mean, there's a couple different types of artifacts we can create: uh, catalogs, matrices, and diagrams. Um, those are all going to be part of the uh, the uh, iterative ADM process. This shows a relationship between the deliverables, artifacts, and building blocks. Um, as you can see, there's an architectural deliverables and the building blocks, and you know we, we might generate uh, different catalogs, matrices, diagrams. Um, we might pull in and describe the different building blocks. And then we, we eventually move that information into the architecture repository. This is an example of an architecture definition document where we have a re building a requirement, you know, with customer service representative. You know, here's the different process flows, here's the use cases, um, and that type of information. And here's, here's what the building block is, a basic call handling process and a target call handling process. The enterprise continuum overview. This one, this one, uh, was pretty interesting. It, it, it kind of goes into a, a, a discussion about um, architectures versus solutions. Um, and the thought process is that the architectures um, define and, and illustrate what type of functionality we're looking for. It's like an abstraction where the solution is an implementation of that architecture. The, the enterprise continuum is a, is a grouping of architecture and solutions. And the intent is, is that as you like over here in the foundation architecture, this is very high level, very abstract type of concepts. Primarily, and most of us will probably be living here, which is the common system architectures um, that we're building. And then there's industry architectures where you're, you're specifically talking about a specific industry branch. And then there's organizations. So like for fraud department, they would only have this and that type of architecture. None of these are actual implementations. These are just basically documenting and, and illustrating what the capabilities are, what the type of interface we're looking for, what type of um, infrastructure we're looking for for that specific architecture. Then what happens is as, those, as we drop down, we have solutions. Um, these solutions actually are additional documentation that support what was representing in that architecture. <coughs> so as you can see, it's, it's basically very abstract down to very uh, uh, descriptive, very uh, very abstract, down to very granular. This section is the, uh, the reference model. There's, there's two reference models. There's the technical reference model and there's the uh, integrated information infrastructure reference model. And one of, the th one of the core concepts in TOGAF is boundaryless information flow. And the last one here is, is part of that. And that's what the essence of TOGAF is, is to just keep the information flowing. That way we have a good idea on what's going on in our infrastructure. The TRM, the technical reference model, um, provides a core ta um, taxonomy for the platform service. Um, in this case, it, it's, a, it's a foundation architecture. I think we use to build any system architecture. The, uh, the triple IRM is a subset of it, and I would argue, um, well, I kind of already talked about this as well. This is the information structure to enable boundary inform information flow. Um, <coughs> This feeds into that, that core foundation architecture. The components of the triple IRM is taxonomy, definitions, terminology, description of the components, conceptual structures, any type of uh, visual representations associated with that implementation. More detail regarding it, you know, we, security, you know, qualities, mobility, ma management policy, um, performance SLAs. You know, here's the development tools that we're leveraging, broker applications, management utilities information consumer application. So there's quite a bit here that we need to expand on more. <coughs> the uh, architecture capabilities framework, um, I would argue this is more around uh, the, the people and the process at PSCU. Um, this is actually setting up, you know, in this case, the governance body, the, uh, you know, the roles and responsibilities, what type of training do we need, skills, knowledge, architecture professions, all that type of information that surrounds a deliverable. You know, so if we build up this, this, this uh, common system architecture, 
What is the skill sets? What's the support organization? What type of roles, what type of information, knowledge do we need to have in order to support this architecture? What other capabilities? You know, the architecture capability from is, you know, establishing an architecture capability. Uh, that, that in itself could be a ADM process. Keep that in mind. Architecture board, architecture compliance, contracts, uh, governance, the architecture maturity models, and the skills framework. I mean, that type of stuff. You know, that's what's involved in delivering a uh, architecture. Establishing an architecture capabilities using the ADM. We got to define the vision, goals, drivers, principles of the architecture practice. So, what are we, you know, what are we trying to do with this? What are we trying to get out of this architecture capability? You know, the next step is define the process views, how the framework to be used, what, what performance metrics are required. Uh, define the data that's going to be required to store in the architecture repository. Also, what applications are required to assist with the process defined in phase B. Um, define technology infrastructure supporting the architecture practice. How best to manage the organization changes that are required, how this is achieved, how best to adopt the new systems and processes. Governing and implementation of business architecture. Um, changes to the process system should be managed here and requirements to be clearly articulated inside. Um, the architecture board responsibilities. Um, this is where a lot of the decision making gets made on the, in the uh, architecture. Uh, it provides some level of consistency across subsystems. Um, you know, it's, it's one central point where we're actually bringing all the different technologies and trying to make sure we got some level of focus across all of these implementations that we're doing. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mahmoud, but this, I would argue this is the oversight team right now as it stands. Sort of, yes. Yes. There's also another uh, steering team ahead of, above the oversight team called ATTACK. So I think it's a col collaboration effort between the two. And I think at some point, I think SWAT would fit in there as well. This is where we can you know, target you know, re reuse of components. Normally, this is, this would be, I would argue this would be captured in the tech assessment, but um, flexibility of the architectures. This, this one's kind of tough, because this one's always been hard for PSU, but this is the enforcement of architecture compliance. In my mind, I've always tried to be very flexible with that, but with, with the advent of this architecture board, I think we're, we're going to see it maybe a little bit more you know, making sure we kind of comply and play nice with each other a little better. Um, the other thing is it helps improve the maturity level of PSU. I mean, right now, if you were to look at the CMMI um, and compare that to PSU, we're, we're pretty bad, as Sam mentioned when in one of, the, one of our first meetings we had with Sam as an all-hands meeting. This kind of goes back to the, you know, the, the you know, <coughs> same thing with the, what I was talking about before, the ITS governance and, and architecture capabilities. The uh, establishing some architecture contracts, I mean, that's another thing that, that, that's part of TOGAF is here's some contracts, here's, here's, here's some rules and guidance, you know, that we need to try and follow when we're doing these implementations. Contract between architecture function and the business users. So it, it's, it's basically saying here's what we've decided on, let's make sure that we're, we're following the contract. Um, it's no different if it would be a contract with a third party vendor, here's the contract we have established, we're going to have this, this, and this, we need this, cap this and this capability. You need to deliver that. And the same thing within PSU. I have a contract with, with this other portion of the organization. We need to make sure that we, we're in compliance. This is the uh, architecture governance key processes. Policy management, compliance, dis dispensation, monitoring and reporting, and business control. This is, the, like, like I was saying before, this is really the um, part, part of the oversight um, team. I think it's going to be, I think as other teams get stood up and we start integrating all of these, we need to make sure we have a, a consistent process flow across all of these different teams and, and establishments. That way we can deliver a, you know, a proper message across. I think this is where the ADM kind of fits in SWAT. It could potentially fit in with SWAT. It can fit in with the oversight team and, again, you know, all the way up to, you know, the business as well. EA maturity model. I mean, that's one of the things as part of the uh, architecture capabilities uh, framework is to define what the maturity model is of the organization um, as, a, as a data point. This is, remember, this is boundaryless information, so we're bringing in all these different specifications and uh, practices for defining what the organization, about the organization. And then here, you know, this is just an example of, you know, here's a EA maturity models. I think we're down here somewhere, and that's my personal opinion. I, I, I'm sure other people would probably think differently. And I'm not, hopefully I'm not trying to upset anybody, but in my mind, based on what I've seen, we're, we've, we've got a lot of work ahead of us because um, we're, we're a very reactive group. I, I think most organizations are here at level three, and, I, I, and I, based on what I understand and heard in the past, it's, always, it's taken years. Just, you know, bump from, so two years. <laughs> Takes to get to here. <laughs> the other thing is the architecture skills framework. I mean, this is, this is, 
There's, there's a little bit more involved with the architecture capability framework, but I didn't want to go into too much details here. I mean, I've, I've already kind of beat a dead horse, but this is, this is kind of the, what I've already talked about, which is what's the skills required for this architecture? What type, of, what type of organization do we have to have behind this architecture in order to support it moving forward? Because the company needs to know that type of information because it needs to make those type of, you know, they need to make decisions based on that. In summary, uh, the ADM is an iterative process and it, it, it can happen enterprise-wide or down to the project level. So depending on what you're working on, there's, there's always an opportunity to leverage the ADM and put that information in the architecture content repository. The uh, ADM guidelines and techniques, this is basically like it says, here's the guideline, here's the inputs, here's the outputs for this different phase of the ADM. And uh, here's some techniques to gather some of that information and help you get, that, get to that output that you're looking for. The architecture uh, contact framework, this is where you're going to store a lot of the architecture building blocks um, and type of information. This is where the continuum sits, right? Enterprise continuum sits in there. The enterprise continuum sits in there. Enterprise continuum is, a, like we talked about, shows a high level architecture, shows what the different solutions we have. So the thought process is we ever had to go back and figure out some information about this solution or about what this implementation was, we can go, we would go down here and say, give me more information about it. And then if we wanted to know what the, what the actual architecture deliverables were, as far as what were we trying to deliver, you would go up in here and say, what's the architecture um, continuum representation of that solution? Um, here's the two reference models. This, the, the TOGAF reference model, this is a uh, foundation architecture. The III RM, I would argue, is a common system architecture. And this is, remember, keep in mind that this is the uh, implementation, the thought process is a bound release flow of information. Architecture capabilities for framework. This is where we define what the about the organization, skills, roles, responsibilities, establishing and operating the architecture. One of the things that, that when we went to class, uh, our instructor, his name was Steve Ells, he kind of left us with this at the end of it, and I kind of, it kind of sunk in. But the thought process is, TOGAF is really about vision, getting a baseline, defining the target, figuring out what the gaps are, what type of choices can we make, what's the roadmap, how, what, you know, the implementation, and then we need to govern. That was the essence of TOGAF from Steve Ells' point of view. And, and for mine, I kinda, they kind of like sunk in because yeah, that's, that's what TOGAF's all about. You know, you, you, when you're doing each project at any level, here's what you need to know. It's like, what's, what am I trying to deliver? What do I already have? What am I trying to get to? What do I need to, what's the, what's the issues and concerns with building that solution? Um, what type of choices do I have? What are, what are those options, what can I do? You know, where does this fit in with the roadmap? And, and let, let's implement it, and now we have to govern it and maintain it. Sam's question is, is what, when are we gonna do the first iteration of the ADM and TOGAF implementation and generate a set of, a list of artifacts so that everybody can see what, the, uh, what, what type of documents were generated based on the TOGAF templates and deliverables? And then the, uh, the question, the, I deferred the question to Mahmoud because at some point we need to define which project that's gonna be and move that project forward with TOGAF. You're absolutely right. Answering to Sam's question, it's